Phil Stafford, and I'm the president of the board of the uh, Monroe County History Center. Uh, pleased to do that, and uh, it's been a wonderful adventure. And uh, as a board member, as we have other board members here tonight, you want to raise your hands if there are board members? Excellent. And uh, we're embarking on a process to uh, improve the uh, educate our board and improve our board over the next few years, and uh, this is part of that series. We have a speaker from the Indiana Historical Society coming down in June, sometime in June, to talk about being a board member for a museum, which uh, would be uh, valuable uh, training and support for our board members as well. Nevertheless, we have a really incredible, outstanding board, and uh, uh, we're in the process of seeking board members and have got a wind up slate, thanks to Teresa. And um, I, I've noticed this over the last two or three years. Am I am I speaking loud enough for cats? No? The mic's not on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I am speaking in the microphone and he's still not shaking his head yes. Um, okay, good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. As I was saying, we have a incredible board really, really wonderful board. <laughs> We're a little soft-spoken. <laughs> but it's a very talented group of people. And uh, as I was getting ready to say, every year when we invite people onto the board, it's always, yes, 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 I've always wanted to do that. Uh, we've never experienced rejection. So that says a lot about the quality of this institution. Um, we have a quality executive director who's uh, in our kind of halfway through his second year here. He's going to talk a little bit more about his own background and experience, which I think you'll find very interesting. <coughs> and uh, we felt it was important to uh, reflect on the role of the museum in our community and how important it is as an institution. And also talk a little bit about how museums work. Uh, because a lot of people in the general public don't really understand what goes into an exhibit. And uh, it's a complex undertaking. And uh, I think you'll find that interesting as well. So this kind of kicks off uh, the first of a number of educational programs we hope to do in the coming year, some of which will <coughs> be targeted to board members, some of which will be targeted to the overall membership of the History Center. I hope you're all members. And some where we'll be inviting the general public and other museum folks as well. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Schlegel, Jr., uh, our executive director. <coughs> Glad so many people could make it. For everyone on Zoom, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Mom. <laughs> we get in trouble with anyone, so. Um, you have to turn the microphone on, too. <laughs> Is this better? Cats, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. I got a thumbs up, so we'll take that as a good sign. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited to see so many faces, to talk to so many people. I had some different groups that asked us about if we were Zooming it or if it was only in person, so they were very excited. So I hope we have a good crowd online. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through a couple things, but one of the first things I wanted to do, I know everyone's comfy, so you don't have to do it, but if you don't mind, if you can stand up for just a moment, um, and people at home will just trust you. Um, but I just want to do a quick exercise real quick. So if you've been to a museum, any museum at all, in the last 10 years, stay standing. I really like this crowd. This is what I was hoping for. So if you've been to a museum within the last five years, stay standing. Two years? Okay, so if you've been to the Scurry, or Scurry County, that's one of my old places. If you've been to the Monroe County Museum in the last year for exhibits, not for meetings, not for board, but if you've been to here just to see an exhibit, stay standing. This is really, this is a great, great crowd. Okay, go ahead and sit down, I promise. That's all your exercise. 
eat all the snacks. Um, so what I, I really want to do, and one of the things that when, when Phil and when uh, Susan, my predecessor, were talking to me as, when I was a candidate, is how they wanted to do a lot more with getting the community involved. And that's one of the big things I want to try to do since, it was, since I've been here for a year. Um, I wanted to, I had a better feel, the lay of the land, so I'm hoping So real quick, my background is um, I went to school originally for archaeology at Kent State. I switched over to history, and I actually fell into museums on accident. I had had a really bad high school teacher. I did not like history. I still don't like reading history books unless I have to. Um, but I love the places. And so when I went to get my, and I kind of muddled around in college, I was always a decent student, but never outstanding. When I went back for my master's degree, um, out of a class of 12, when I graduated, I was the top 10%, so I don't know if I was the person or the point two, but I was one of those, and it came so easy to me. I, I genuinely loved it. I had a lot of excitement, and so um, I included some of my classmates uh, that I graduated with. We were just very excited to be done at that point with so much school. I was also full-time working at a museum, as I'll show you here, um, when I worked at Dayton History. I worked there for five years, it was a 65-acre park with 30 buildings, so every day was literally quite different. These are a few of the activities I did, from launching hot air balloons, to running a 1930s-era print shop, to riding a high-wheel bike. That really is me. There's no CGI or anything else, I promise. Um, so I did a lot of hands-on activity, and museum education was my background. And this might be surprising, but that's where I really came out of my shell. Believe it or not, I was really very quiet before then, but I had to walk up to complete strangers and say, how are you doing today? Let me tell you about this. And to know enough to be able to answer questions. So there was a bit of trial and error, but I really started to enjoy that and realize this is what I want to do, which is why I went back for my master's. From there, um, I moved into administration at the Scurry County Museum. I was there for about eight, a little over eight years. And it was a museum that they'd actually talked about shuttering uh, with less than 600 people a year before I arrived. And when I left in early 2018, um, we had almost 11,000 visitors a year. Um, so we really ramped up what we did. People would come from around just to see us. And we just had a lot of fun. Like we loved history, but we got a lot of people around. So you can see on the far side, we had different veterans exhibits. We literally had a pre-World War II Jeep we pulled into there. It was November of 41, but that's pre-World War II for the U.S., so we just made it under the radar. We had so many kids. We had one time where their zoo field trip was canceled, so we had 500 kids come in three days. Uh, talk about all hands on deck, but the school loved us after that. Um, we had our Texas Ranger out for an exhibit, so um, I'm still my same height, so you can see how much taller he is. Um, and I made sure I stayed on this side of the law. He researched us before he came out. He's like, okay, I researched all your staff. No one does anything bad. Good. I was really glad to hear that. Um, and we also made wanted posters for that one, so um, I was wanted in Texas, so how many people could say that? Um, from there, I went to the School of Mines. The views were fantastic, as you can see. We had the Miss Colorado crown, so I met a bunch of Miss Colorados, which was always fun. And then um, the mom for them, if you will, she was great, she was hilarious. She always made them pose next to me and get pictures, so um, she really enjoyed that. And then this was me with my boss, Renata, after one of our big gala events. We were ready to be done for the night, so it was just a fun, um, a fun place, but it was definitely a place where it was rocks on shelves. And that, that just didn't appeal as much to me because, don't get me wrong, there's some beautiful specimens and geology is fascinating. However, it was literally a rock on a shelf with a label that said its name, its chemical composition, and where it was found. And for me, that's just not engaging enough, but they were happy with that. The guy that was the curator even said, well, if you're not in the top 10% of geologists, why else would you come here? I just didn't feel right with that. I just wanted to be open for anyone and everyone, and I wanted to do a lot more, which is why I wound up here. So I did change shirts, I don't have a tie on like I do in that one, um, but I've been here for about a year and a half and I'm really excited about it. Um, but a lot of people go, wow, you've got a lot of museum experience. How did that happen? 
Uh, and my parents can verify this. Um, since my childhood, two places made a huge impact on me. One was the Air Force Museum. It was in the backyard in Dayton, Ohio. I've been there a million times. I've seen a lot of great changes. The other is the Alamo. Uh, my mom's from San Antonio, so we have family, so we always had to go. My parents and my brother are not museum people. I'm the one that they would go, and they'd be like, okay, you have one hour. My grandparents had got my brother and I these little digital watches. We thought we were so cool. Um, as you can see in this photo, since I was little, and my parents would say, okay, you have one hour to see the Alamo. To them, it meant the entire compound, the whole area. To me, no. That was just the little mission. <laughs> that was one hour. My parents were like, we did that in five minutes. How are you still in here? So I've always loved the location of where things happen. So when I came here, and it was in an old library, and Hillary told me about how the old, uh, for the women's suffrage group, the old entry to this room is actually right behind us in the back of the room, and those suffragettes would come in here, and this is where they met before women had a chance to vote, and this is where they planned and talked about and did all of their work, at least time to time there were some of their meetings, was right here in this room. To me, that, that just means so much. That really appeals to me. So when I was looking for jobs and I found out all of that about this place, that made me so excited. So one of the things, and I just realized I have a spelling error that I totally missed several times. Uh, there's three basic things that museums do. Does anybody want to guess what one of those would be? Great money. Yes, who? Thank you, Roger. Can you guys pass this one? I'm not above bribing people in order to get answers. But we raise money. That is, that is excellent. Not one of the main pillars, but that's definitely one. Kelly? Collections? Collections. We always collect things. So that is absolutely one of the things we do. So collections is one of them. This side of the room is really good. What about this side? You've been real quiet. Tell stories. We tell stories, and so what, would, what else would you call that? It's part of a bigger theme I'm looking for. Um, historical stories of development. <laughs> uh, education. Education, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can pass that one back to Rose and Cheryl. One back there for you, too. So we educate and we collect, and there's one more thing, a third thing that we do. Get some more candy. Exhibits. Exhibits. I'm considering that a part of education since we're educating people with our items. This one's a little. This one's definitely a little bit trickier. Preserve. <coughs> yes. Preservation. We want to. We want to save the items we collect. Rose, what'd you get last time? Here, I'll get you a dum dum this time. That's not a, that's not anything about you, Rose. I promise. Um, but yes. To work here. So we collect, we preserve, and we educate. All museums do that to a point. Some of them lean differently. Some of them have an emphasis on a different way on these different things. But all museums, these are the three very basic very simplified things all museums should be doing. So collections, what do we collect? Do we just take anything? If somebody walked in from Alaska or Nebraska and gave us their grandmother's bonnet, do we collect? So where, how do we collect? Where, where, where do we get these ideas from? Monroe County. Monroe County, that's one of the big ones. Thank you, Phil. Hand that back to Phil. So that's one of the ways, what else? I, did someone else over? That's what I said. Did you as well? Do you mind handing that all the way back so we get that to Glenda? Thank you, Kerma. So what else? There's no wrong answer. Even if you're wrong, y'all, I promise I'll still give you candy. I'll just hand you the whole. Thank you, Teresa. So what else? How else do we determine what we collect? From your mission. Thank you, Rose, from our mission. <laughs> <laughs> she said she was going to heckle me, so that, that's the only warning I got Rose was coming. Any other ideas on, on how we get what we collect? So we came up with a whole list to kind of give people an idea. There's quite a few things. So there is mission, but we have initiatives. 
There's specific things we want to collect, we recognize we don't have. For instance, our African American community, we're very lacking in that. We are actively going out and trying to open up some different pathways, some communication to try to talk to people, to try to get things. We also have an active LGBTQ plus initiative to try to open up more and make sure everyone knows this is their community museum. Can we care for it? We've had some items come in that they're in such rough shape that we just, we pour all of our research, even though no matter how neat it is, even if it is Monroe County, even if it is a very unique piece where it hits several of these, if we can't care for it, should we take it? There's also the, con that's with condition, the size. I, I'm literally, I've worked at those four museums. This is my fourth one. I've been offered a train car at every single museum I've worked at. <laughs> Only the first museum was that able to actually happen because they also had storage off. But 65 acres, we, you had a place or two to put a train car. But everyone asks about train cars. As much as I would like it, and I'm sure we'd get a lot of attention, we don't have the room for a train car. It's unfortunate but it's also reality, we can't care for that, so we are not able to take it. Is it appropriate? I can't tell how many times I've heard people go, oh, my great-grandmother uh, rode out to Nebraska from, from Boston, here's a trunk of all of her stuff. <clears throat> well, she doesn't have a connection to here. Her descendants do, which is great, but if those items don't have a connection with Monroe County, where we are, it's not in our best interest. We shouldn't be collecting that when it's someone else's history. The number of items. We might get a single item, or there could be a thousand pieces of it. Are we, are we gonna be able to care for that many of them? Do we have to have all of them? So we have to keep an eye on things like that. The provenance. Somebody could walk in and say, hey, I have this game of Clue, and we know Har Hoagie Carmichael played that. That'd be a great piece. But if that's family story and there's no pictures, there's no newspaper accounts, there's no way to say it, it's just what we said it was. But we can also say one of these chairs, Hope B. Carmichael sat in, doesn't make it true. So we have to be able to look at the connections, especially for items like that. And is there a need? We have some of the initiatives, we know there are certain needs of what we, we want, what we need to get to be able to, to share our history, and also the uniqueness. Again, if, if I played a game of Clue here in Monroe County, do we need to collect that Clue board? Probably not. <laughs> I'm aware of this. <laughs> but if Hoagie Carmichael did, or another famous citizen did, we might go, ooh, ooh, that makes it unique, and we know it's from a family member or a friend of the family that has pictures to be able to prove, or an entry in a journal or something to be able to prove that connection. That's what's important. So the next thing we do is preservation. So as I mentioned before, this is one of the, this is the hard one. Everyone forgets about this part. Has anyone been upstairs to see the quilt exhibit that Gabby just put up about the showers quilt? I see a bunch of nods or, or hands raising. What's really neat is that was part with our preservation work. We have a volunteer Coley who on Fridays comes in to volunteer her time and under Gabby and Hillary's care, our, our assistant curator and curator respectively, she's helping to save that quilt that's over 100 years old. So if we don't do anything, it's just a slow march to deterioration. So we're trying to do that. So what's unique is Gabby took that and the history of the quilt and the history of what, the, what happened to cause it and rolled that into one nice exhibit for us to be able to share with the public. So preservation is a big thing that we need to do. So certain things, best practices, in the, in the 80s, there were some of those magnetic photo books everyone loved and they liked to share. Turns out those aren't so great for photos. So some of the photos that are in older scrapbooks, even though they're older, they're in better shape than some of the photos from the 80s because of what was used to preserve them. So sometimes there are mistakes made, but we try to, to correct them and rectify those as fast as we can. And in some instances, even if we had the ideal setup, with UV filters to help with the sun rays up on our second floor right above us. If they do their job, they're gonna absorb all those UV rays. We have to replace them. There's different ratings. Some are good for five years, some are good for closer to 10. 
but depending on how much sun you get, we constantly have to replace those or boxes. If they're acid free, depending on what's inside, they'll absorb some of the acid. They need to be thrown out and we need to constantly redo those. So preservation, is, it's an ongoing thing. We can't just put up UV filters and be like, oh, we're good. We have to make sure that we come back later so that we can continue to save things. And then education. So I know there was one about stories that was mentioned earlier. There's a bunch of other items we do with education as well. Um, we have the exhibits. There's more of the long-term or permanent exhibits or the short-term ones like Gabby's Quilt Display or our Alexander Memorial exhibit that's upstairs. If you come back a year from now, those exhibits won't be there. But if you go upstairs and you want to see the Talia Farrow exhibit on George and Vi, that'll be here a year from now. And if the family finds something unique or something they'd like us to, to share, chances are for an exhibit like that, we can probably work that in. So there might be new things in the Talia Farrow exhibit. There's also educational programs. We have our education manager up front here. She does a lot of our programming K through 12. College students next week, if I remember correctly. We have college classes coming in. We go to senior and retirement homes. And then we have family days where we try to have families come in for activities just to see and experience everything we have here. So a lot of programming, but again, that falls under education. We want to show off what we have. We've got some, if anyone's been upstairs on the third floor, we have some amazing stuff up there. Some really neat stuff so we can turn virtual. We can't take everyone up on the third floor but we can show it off virtually in the exhibits to do different talks. I know Andrea's given some talks for us. So we try to get out where we can and show off because our space is very limited um, and immersive. Upstairs in the, the Alexander Memorial exhibit, Hillary was able to get 3D printed parts to that exhibit. So instead of just standing there and trying to look at everything, you can walk up and touch it. And it kind of feels like limestone as well. So if you've not been up there, it says, please touch. You're allowed to touch. So walk up and, and touch it. That's, that's what it was there for. Um, and access. With Megan, our research librarian in the back, she's trying to provide access to the past for people. One of her most common questions she always jokes about is people call her when they buy a house and they'll go, is my house haunted? <laughs> most of the time, no. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so she has a lot, but we also do it through internships. Through all of our different departments with high school or co especially college students, we want to show them and help educate them on what we do and how we do things to try to get them as excited as we are. Um, so with our focus, we want to collect all of Monroe County. And I always joke, because I hope this really never happens, but if we had an earthquake and this whole building was swallowed up, in 200 years, if they unearthed this building, when they opened us up, they should be able to see a representation of our community here and now. And so that's why we have some of the active initiatives where we're trying to collect. We want to be able to represent what Monroe County is. And we want to make sure we're all of Monroe County, not just Bloomington, even though we're, we can't move our building, but we can still represent all of our communities in Monroe County. So we want to be able to do that. Um, preservation work. Again, we're doing the best we can with what we're able to do. For instance, Hillary said that for cold storage, for things like film and negatives, is ideal. There's a great set of standards out there that's also beyond our means. We can, we unfortunately do not have a refrigerated room where we're able to keep that. Um, it'd be great to go visit in the summertime because there's some days where it gets really warm. But being able to pay for something like that's a little beyond what we're capable of. But we try to do the best we can and there's different workarounds. And we just want to showcase. We have some great strengths in Monroe County. We have some fun and uniquely Monroe County items. So we want to make sure we're showing all of that off. So that's why we're always trying to work with people, get ideas, get out into the community, is we really want to get out and hear people's ideas. Because I can tell you what I'm excited about it doesn't mean anyone else in this room would think that's fun. Trust me. If I can spend an app, has anyone been to the, to the Alamo before? Yeah, and how big is the mission compared to the rest of the grounds? <laughs> I can spend an hour inside the mission and that was, that was pushing it. I could spend half a day there easily. It doesn't mean anyone else will find that nearly as exciting as I do, I, I believe it. But if we hear from all kinds of people what's interesting, 
What's neat is when we, when we look at our social media, when we talk to visitors that come in or call us or email, we'll start to see trends emerging. Hillary's gone, you know, I've gotten a bunch of phone calls. Uh, for instance, somebody happened to mention Barnes. They had Barnes on the brain. And we had enough people, and all of a sudden, because of Phil, who's right over here, we're doing a Barnes exhibit next year, next fall? 2024. 24, but next fall though, not this fall, next. Uh, we're gonna have a Barnes exhibit because different independent people, unless Phil told a bunch of people, hey, go tell them you like Barnes. <laughs> uh, but we heard ideas from the community. I don't know if we would have done a barn exhibit. I like looking at them. I know Cheryl's told me about her barn a few times. Um, I've learned a little bit from Danielle Bashant Ball when she comes in and when we have things, we, we learn a lot, but it's not until we hear from the public what they want to see, what they like to see, that we're able to really put some of these together to create these exhibits. How could you not like barns? <laughs> I like them. They just don't excite me as some other things do. So I, I, I don't dislike them at all. I'm very excited about the exhibit. I want to make that very clear. So Phil had a great idea. But Phil spoke up one day. He said, oh, I like barns. We just redid ours. Let's do this. We were like, oh, we'll look into it. And sure enough, a bunch of people were excited. So that's what we like. Okay, so, <laughs> yes, we make sure when Phil talks, we make sure we like, he had a good idea. I want to make sure Phil got credit too. <laughs> it was very important. But what else we do? I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten yelled at for raising people's tax rates. We're a nonprofit. I, we, we don't control their taxes, but there's people that will call or come in and they're upset when they come in. We get research requests. People, um, just because I was a history major, people are like, you'll be great on trivia. Tell me what all of the 12 legions were that attacked this, you know, town in Carpathia. And I'm like, I have no idea. I know it's history. I don't know that much. So because of that, when people call about research, there's a lot that we have. It doesn't mean we have it all stored up here. Now, Megan is incredible because she does remember a lot of that. And a lot of the volunteers in the library really can go, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was in 1956. It's this file right over here. And I'm going, good for you. That's, that's impressive. But people call with all kinds of research. We don't always have those at our fingertips, but we can find them relatively fast. Um, and we got a lot of concerns. Um, people are worried about different things in the community. There were some concerns about the Alexander Memorial that they were getting rid of the Confederate side of things on the memorial. Um, so we had to gently remind them that um, Williamson Alexander was a Union veteran. Um, so he, that is the soldier on top. There was no Confederate soldier on there. Um, so, but, but talking to people about that, um, I have randoms up there. We do have uh, various homeless people. Some will come in for just a cup of coffee. Some we've had to call for our community officer on. So a big disruption in the day. Um, and no day goes according to our plans. We can lay out the best things. I had a phone call the other day. Hey, there's an office clearing out a whole bunch of furniture. It's all free. Do you want some? Oh, we could, we could use some new stuff. So we were able to go over. So. It's entertaining, but definitely no day goes, goes according to plan. And then throughout this week, our phone and internet were in and out. So that made things really difficult to try to call people. Or if you had a dropped call, you're like, I don't know what their number was. And they think we just hung up on them. Um, so it makes for an entertaining day. That is definitely for sure. Um, and we are always raising funds and looking for places. A lot of people don't realize stuff like the HVAC or to paint the walls because people bump into them or spill stuff. So we're always looking at how to do more and try to be more here. And then staffing. Um, I have to say, we've hired some of the best. We have some amazing staff members. If you've not met all of them, I know Andrea's here, but if you've not met uh, Justin, Toby, Hillary, Gabby, Megan, they are fantastic people and they are great at what they do. And so in order to do the amazing things we do, we try to hire the best people we can. Um, Megan was really excited and wanted to give me a bunch of examples, so I'll leave this up for a moment, but in addition to the haunted question, she has a lot of questions about research, uh, about monkeys. If you know Megan, she loves monkeys, so she does not mind answering monkey questions. Um, so she gets a lot of various questions, but we also get people that want to know more about memberships, if we have them, what kind of benefits they get. There's a lot more they want to know. Um, a lot of people will ask us how much their items are worth. They'll call us and say, I have a lantern from a caboose. How much is this worth? <laughs> we haven't seen it, and we're not allowed to legally appraise some of that stuff because 
there's just laws with that. It's a long story. If you're ever bored one night and you can't sleep, I'll tell you all kinds of great stories about that. Um, but we, we get a lot, and then we get teachers or, or like with summer camps, I just heard a lot of stuff about summer camps coming up and filling up already in February. Summer camps are already filling up. Um, teachers will call that want to get a hold of Andrea or know, want to know what we do here, what we offer, if they can bring kids here, if we can go to them. So we get all kinds of stuff just constantly all day, which is great that we're being used as that resource. Um, but there's four ways we do it. We have amazing volunteers. I see a lot of faces in this crowd that have volunteered for us currently or in the past or have talked about it. Our volunteers are our lifeblood. They're able to help us provide so much more in the community. I talked about staff. We have some amazing people. I hope we can retain some amazing people. But if you get great staff, you get great results. We also have donations. People that come in and say, oh, and my dad's stuff, I found this 1956 BHS uniform, would you be interested? Yeah, that's great. Let's have you talk to Hillary about what all that entails. Or if somebody has something of interest they want to bring in, or we have folks that they'll come in and say, we'd like to, we'd like to make a donation. Do we have to do anything special? We'll just let you know what our name is, and we're happy to show you around. So all kinds of donations. And then partnerships. Actually, I'm really lucky because two ladies from Resilience Productions are right here. Um, Liz is in Aruba, so I feel terrible for her right now. Um, but we talked about having a partnership, and next month, on the 17th through 19th, they're having a production right here in this room about resilient women. It's a three-day run, and we're going to have this as a partnership. And I'm super excited because in October, we're going to do it again with a new play production is a more appropriate term so we're so excited that community members want to work with us we want to work with them because of what we provide and we're all genuinely excited about it all the staff is excited you ladies are excited people have been calling us when do tickets go on sale they are on sale bus Kirk Trumley if anybody wants tickets um, it's gonna be a great time it is so exciting and to work with other parts of our community so we can we can be exposed to more people. We can show people everyone is welcome here. We want them here. And the biggest thing is what we want to do is consolidate resources. Why do we need to reinvent the wheel if other people are already doing something very well? So we want to partner with as many people as we can where it makes sense to try to get more people involved and aware. Um, so our biggest thing, we collect, preserve, and educate, but we want to do it for both the current and future populations. Think about somebody in five or 10 years from now. What do we want to collect or have laid out or displayed so when they come out, they're as excited as we all are, or the folks online. But how do we get them here? How do we get them excited? So we're, even though we're collecting the past, we're always looking to the future and what we can do and how we can do better. Um, and how we do it's with you. We need the community. One of the top three things that happens when somebody moves somewhere is they want to know how the schools are, what there is to do, and if there's museums. We always rank in the top five things of what people want to see or th what they want to be able to do. And so we want to be a great resource. There was a time, I see some of the garage sale ladies are here. Hopefully you talked in our last sale in November. Some folks had just moved to town a month before, a week before, not long before our sale. And they're like, oh, we just like to support local institutions, so we bought a membership to the History Center. They had no idea we had a garage sale. So the folks in their neighborhood went, oh, ho, 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 that's a perfect place to buy a membership for. They have this amazing garage sale. You can outfit your whole house. <laughs> so they went to the garage sale, and I think they bought, what, a quarter of the stuff there to outfit their whole house? <laughs> I mean, they, yeah. They, they came back every day because, one, they had a membership, so they got in early. But they were so excited, like, wow, this is great. We can buy stuff for our house, and we keep supporting the History Center. Uh, and they're like, and we haven't been in there yet. We just bought a membership online. That's great, too. Come back anytime and visit us. We'll give you a great tour. <laughs> but they were so excited, and they wanted to. So having community members that told them what a great institution we are, that means so much to us as staff. I'm sure as board members, that has to make our board members feel great that people are that excited like we are. Um, how you can help, ask questions. Be like Phil, be like, hey, I have a great idea. We just redid a barn, did you know? And have great ideas. 
We, we like talking and communicating with people. And use us as a resource. We have Gloria from hand in all the time, or other community members that just want to know more or do more. They do research either in the library or on the third floor for Hillary. Sometimes she has photographs or things they want to see or use. We're a resource. That's why we're here, is we want to preserve that past, but what good is it if it's sitting in a, in a box and no one knows about it? We want people to come out and use it and to do it and enjoy it. We want people to have fun. I know I haven't mentioned Michael Carter yet, but he's the ringleader. It's pretty accurate. Is that your proper term? For the Monroe County History Club. Grand Poobah. Grand Poobah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ringleader must be one of the other guys in the, in the circle there. But they do a great job with Monroe County history, but he has a lot of fun. But we have another partnership there where we promote them. They let us come out and sell our books. We, we, <clears throat> excuse me. we help promote each other and try to be excited about it. Michael, Jen, have you, if you haven't talked to Michael, I know he has to run for the ball game before long, but say hi. He's genuinely excited about history. He loves talking about history and what they do. It gets people excited. I, I wasn't born or raised here. I've been here a year and a half, and I love it. I'm always learning new stuff, and I enjoy it. And someone like Michael, some ladies at the garage sale, when they grab me and they go, hey, did you know about this? And they tell me about something they they saw or a piece of memorabilia that came through the garage sale and they're telling me about it, their excitement, that's what I feed on. I don't know if you saw and noticed in the picture, uh, there were two pictures of the Alamo. One, I was a small child. The other, I was an adult. And I was still making goofy faces. My mom's like, you never learn. Um, but I'm genuinely excited by stuff like that and I really enjoy it and so does the rest of the staff. So we have this and um, because you laughed at some of my other jokes, I just want to let you know how excited I am about history. My mom found this when she was finding the Alamo picture. Uh, here's a picture of my brother and I, I believe from 88 or 89. I'm the front left one, and I'm genuinely excited about I can't quite tell if it's a prairie schooner or a Conestoga wagon, but I was just so excited to have my picture taken by this piece of history. Um, schooner. Okay, Andrea thinks it's more of a prairie schooner than a Conestoga wagon. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited by this. Um, so I genuinely love it and I hope everyone else does as well or wants to be involved. So if you have questions, um, I tried to end perfect right about now. So we have a little time for questions. I know some people have to leave at 630 for other presenters or ball games. Um, please feel free to ask questions. I grabbed all of the staff cards. I put them up here on our, the bench so I can help hand them out if anyone has questions. If you have, feel free to ask in front if you don't mind a crowd. Andrea said there's a few questions online, so let's get started with a couple of those. Yeah, so a question from Nancy. You mentioned your mission to increase community participation and your success in a previous museum. How is that going in Monroe County and how can the community help? Excellent question. So community par or participation is, is, is fantastic. We've already started to see increases. We've already had people asking how they can partner with us. I was just talking to uh, Marissa, the operations director at Girls Inc. this morning. She's crazy excited. We want to partner and work with them. So the biggest thing is, is in part what the staff can do, but we don't have all of the connections. So if people know other institutions or if they want to know more. For instance, Andrea has some tubs where she lets schools use those or people can come here. I don't know if you, I know it's dark so people online you won't be able to see it, but there's a wagon on top of the coat rack in the back. I know it's difficult for her to put in her car so when she has a, an event here it's easier, but she has a pack your wagon program with children where they learn more about packing your wagon like the one up there and they get more of that hands-on experience and with teachers, sometimes it can be hard to find the right teacher to get into school. So if someone is a teacher, has a neighbor, they, they work with someone whose husband or wife is a teacher, we're always looking for connections like that. So feel free to reference people our way. Even if it's just our general number, we're great at sorting out who it should go to. But connections, either come to us and say, hey, here's my neighbor's number. She's waiting for you to call her. Fantastic. We can't wait to partner with someone. Or if you're in a group or organization that wants to come here, for instance, Kiwanis came here for the restaurant exhibit, so it was last fall, and had a meeting right here in this room, mm -hmm. a quick one, to go upstairs and wander around restaurants and talk about all the different restaurants and all the different memories from all those different years. And they were very excited when we told them, 
we will be having a second restaurant exhibit because this one was so popular and there were so many restaurants we did not include due to space. So were there other questions or just Nancy so far? Just Nancy so far. Okay. Does anybody here in person have any questions or want to know more about anything? Or if you don't want to ask in front of people, that's okay too. Yes, Phil. The ratio of objects that are exhibited to objects in the collection is always interesting to people and yes. it's sort of analogous to the uh, other things that History Center does that you didn't talk about tonight because yes. there's a lot more. There is. Yeah. This, I was trying to keep this fairly light. I didn't yeah, want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but a lot of museums what they'll do is they'll display maybe up to 10 percent depending on space and abilities. And I believe ours is around what four or five, two percent. I was a high with four or five percent. Um, so what we're able to display versus what we have are very different. Um, if anyone has a lot, a lot of money that'd like to buy us land and, and help us build a new museum, <laughs> we'll be great at helping you spend that money. We are really good at that part. But we have a, a lot, and that's part of the reason when I mentioned the long-term exhibits. For instance, uh, Hillary and I were speaking, I believe it was last week, that she is setting up a game plan on our second floor of the Cook Permanent Gallery, where, for instance, we have RCA up there. We'll have an RCA exhibit, but the physical items that are there might swap out. So that way it's not the same thing every time. We'll bring different items. We have several of the, the nipper dogs that are sitting. She has several more upstairs in storage. So being able to rotate those out and tell more stories um, same with the, the cabin we have upstairs. There's a lot of items in there, but being able to pull some of them off so they can rest, so they're not right there in the atmosphere, because what's comfortable for us isn't always best case for the artifacts. So being able to rotate those is, is one of the good things about having storage, but to what Phil said, I mean, with 2%, we're, we're showing very, very little on what we actually have. That's why we try to do more with our virtual online with rotating exhibits like the ones upstairs that's why they change we've had people are like oh man I really want to see the exhibit about we're not always able to keep them up because there's so much more we want to rotate through and display is there an inventory somewhere written down of the things you don't display we have a there's a, a, a computer system called pass perfect and so that's where we inventory anything and everything we have from photographs to artifacts and it's neat because we can also basically log when it was on display and off. So quilts, for instance, that, that's a really easy one. We have a lot of quilts upstairs. Well, if you did a quilt exhibit, there's always several that are just really eye-catching or in really good shape you want to display. By default, sometimes people are like, hey, we really like this quilt. Let's, let's keep putting that on display. But with this system, we can say, oh, that was on display two years ago. These other ones haven't been on display in more than 10 years we can use that and track them, and so that way we can rotate through what goes on display and when. And we do have access to it online. Okay, that's that's that. So yes, okay. yes. I saw the look in your eye. I know like, what, what Danielle's second question, follow-up is gonna be. But we, we do have that. Now, for instance, um, let's say, Danielle, you did bring a quilt in today. We're not gonna be able to process that where you could go home tonight and be like, hey, everyone, check this. Oh, where's my quilt? Right. We don't. We can't operate quite that fast. There's a few steps we have to go through, but we would be able to get something like that out and on display, or loaded online so yeah. you'd be able to show. Yeah. Great question. How many exhibits, approximately? How many exhibits, different exhibits, do you have per year? So it, it'll vary. It, it, it's about ten ish um, because we also have the display case over here on the right side of the room and that some of that is community oriented so right now with WFHB they're the ones that actually came in and set that up we just provide the space and then it'll be up for two months and then when it comes down we'll pull stuff from our collections you, a lot of our interns will do it so they get hands-on experience of having to set something up in the look Hillary and Gabby we're busy trying to make sure they at least got most of our next exhibit coming up here for the education room off to my right. So this room changes two, maybe three times a year. And then same with the rector gallery upstairs, there's two to three exhibits. And then with Hill Hall right next to the elevator right there, that Hill Gallery, that's, that's the same. It, it, part of it depends, like we'll have a, for instance, a holiday exhibit. Well, it was the end of one year and the start of the next. So 
technically touches in both years. So I try to be careful with saying how many exhibits per year, because that one could technically count in two different years. Um, but but it, it's roughly 10 plus the different ones from our community case that we have up there. Okay, so I have a question. I apologize if I butcher your name. Uh, Leilani, sorry again. Um, she says, firstly, or, sorry, I see no pronouns, I assume. They said, firstly, uh, incredible Daniel, thank you. Secondly, is there anything us out-of-towners can do to help slash donate slash share post slash purchase merch? Fantastic question. <laughs> so um, there's a lot people from out of town can do. Um, whether they come in town, always we always love visitors. So that, that's always a great thing. But we are working on rebuilding our, our museum store, so we hope to have more stuff online. So we're revamping some of that. Um, any support, so just making people aware of what we do, still buying a membership, even if you can't come in to visit, um, or just a donation is fantastic and is always appreciated. Um, and then when, when I have friends that I know are going to different towns, I'm always like, all right, let me tell you about some museums that are there. Trust me, I, I went to a couple of them. So I always try to make sure I tell and promote people just so that they're aware of it. So those are a couple ways, and then social media, sharing those posts, commenting on them, making sure people are aware. That's always fantastic. And then for, if anyone has various items, I, I can't tell how many museums I've been at where, uh, I believe when I was in Texas, we had a, a package arrive from France. We're trying to figure out who of us knows somebody in France. I was like, you know, I, I visited, it's cool. Like it was neat, I got a real French food. <laughs> Turns out somebody from Scurry County, Texas, which is a, look it up. I mean, you'll have to find that on a map and zoom in. They moved from there to France at some point, and this was decades ago, had passed away. People had bought their stuff, and someone just bought and collected it, and it was different <coughs> postcards and different things. Some we had, some were new. They packaged it up and just mailed it to us sight unseen. Mm -hmm. They're just like, we, we looked you up, we thought you'd be interested, not sure if you have all of this, do with it as you please. But they just saw us, and they were like, oh, Scurry County, where is that? And they would, Power of the internet can be used for good. I know there's some bad stuff going on, but can be used for good. And they found us and just sent us all kinds of great stuff just, just because they wanted to. So with donations like that, if anything neat or unique, we always love hearing from people. And was there a second one, or were you just waving two fingers at me, Andrea? Okay, just double checking. So we're always open for questions, so if you do have more, feel free to approach me. Always email, call, stop in and visit us. Uh, we always love visitors if I haven't emphasized that and for anyone that's here online people just come visit and we'll take you around um, But we also have that second floor open. So if you've not seen the Alexander Memorial exhibit Please take your time. It was a great job that Hillary did on that and then the quilt exhibit that Gabby put up um, It's her first exhibit. She did with just by herself. So she did a great job So make sure to take your time and go look upstairs at those and thank you for coming out, everyone. And please enjoy your refreshments. Linda Stafford in the back did a phenomenal job with that. So big round of applause for Linda. And Phil. I know Phil was a great assistant. Don't leave the brownies. Don't leave that out. So if you don't like them, I didn't make them. So we'll put it that way. So, but thank you. The garage sale is in June, is June 9th and 10th. Yeah, so the, we our big fundraiser, the garage sale, will be on June 9th and 10th. It should be a Friday, Saturday. That's Friday, Saturday. Okay. However, Make, if you're a member, it will be the, the 7th. 7th. So members will get in on the 7th. So, And if you really want to be a member to get all kinds of cool benefits and see us more often, um, so we're about to send out our next, or we're preparing our next newsletter, um, we can sell you a membership tonight or online, whatever's easiest for you. So, um, so since fundraising, up uh, yes. early on. I was wondering if you could um, talk about, I know that the garage sale ladies work very hard for fundraising and um, then we have membership, but um, that's probably not enough to sustain the preservation that's needed. So I was wondering if you could talk about goals sure. or some equipment that's needed or uh, things like that. Yeah, excellent. So there was a question just about with, with uh, the garage sale ladies. They, they have a fantastic fundraiser and they do raise quite a bit of money for us. But 
it's not everything that we need, so we have to have other means. So we do have a lot of donations, a lot of memberships. We are very lucky to have an endowment that, def that helps out with a lot. But we're always looking for new and different things. So we do apply to a lot of grants to try to help offset or get. I just I think yesterday I just got an email. Gabby got a grant she just finished writing. So we were super excited. And we were like, all right, go Gabby. Mm -hmm. So we were very excited about things like that, getting grants. Um, for specific needs right now, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I know we, there's all kinds of different things we're looking for. We do have off-site storage for anyone that doesn't know. We did take on the HT Photo Archive, which primarily runs from the late 50s into the mid to early 80s. I know at least the 80s, uh, possibly a little in the early 90s. So with that big of a collection, the time it would take to process all of that all the folders needed, a lot of the film negatives can disintegrate, it's called vinegar syndrome. Um, again, if you can't sleep, just call me, I'll leave a message, you'll fall right asleep. Um, but this is all stuff we have to maintain and keep an eye out for, so the testing kits for things like that, trying to get them all in folders and boxes, there's always a need like that. So depending on, on where people's you know, hearts rely, some people come in and they just love Megan to death in the research library, so they'll donate specifically to her for certain things or for exhibits or on our, our third floor for that preservation. Um, so Hillary would be able to answer exactly what their needs are, but we, we always have a need for um, kind of operational things, if you will, the boxes, the file folders. Do you have a wish list online of uh, some uh, things that might be needed? Uh, maybe some of the yes. donors Yes, we do have an online wish list, and Andrea will probably be able to tell me where it's at. Uh, we have the website, monroehistory.org slash join and give. There's also ways to support, whether it is, um, for example, our Amazon wish list, or also any of our scholarship funds for school kids. I'm gonna plug that because I'm biased. Um, <laughs> but um, we have plenty of ways to uh, support on that page as well. And we, we will have to work on updating stuff, so if people are interested, and there's always bigger ones, we did have a very generous donor who um, helped fund an intern to go through and help sort, organize, scan, and catalog uh, the first year for the HT for 10 hours a week. So it was a huge, huge benefit for us to have a donor like that that just came in that and we wouldn't have thought of asking, you know, when you calculate that out for someone to ask. And, um, he was very generous and came in when we talked with him. He's like, oh, I can help with that. Fantastic, we would love that. So we do have bigger things like that. So if people do have stuff that they want to work with us on, we're absolutely uh, very excited about that. And what Phil had mentioned earlier about our educational series, Phil had brought in Pam Davidson about doing an estate planning, not just for us, but just in general. And she did a great job on that. So I have had two or three people that asked you know, we'd, we'd like to start working with you about our estate planning and looking towards the future. So um, if it is a bigger thing, please feel free to reach out. Or if, if, for instance, if you just love preservation and quilts and you want to donate towards that, come in and let us know. We, we are happy to show you what we have, what we need. Um, so some people have in their hearts what they, what they really love, you know, quilts. I have an aunt that loves quilts. Um, I love using quilts, so she made me a bunch of quilts. It was great. Um, but if people have stuff like that they like, come talk with us because we can show you what we have and what we <coughs> need. But we do have general wish lists on Amazon and on our website. You see, there's an online. Charlie has the question, do we just rely on donated items, uh, but do we also buy stuff? I'm assuming for the collection. Yes, so for our collection, we do try to stay away from, from purchasing items unless absolutely necessary or it's a very unique circumstance just because if we were to go out of our way and purchase one specific thing, like a very rare uh, program from a first resilience production that I'm sure is quite <laughs> valuable. Um, you know, we, we don't want to go out of our way and purchase something like that because then anyone else that comes in will go, oh, I've got this really neat shirt you're going to need too, but it's only going to be $250. So we, we try not to purchase things like that unless it's an absolute necessity, and we definitely don't want to advertise that. But there are always tax breaks, so that's why we can't appraise how much things are. But if people want to donate to us, we're able to work with them because we have received some valuable collections, 
and they work with an outside appraiser for tax purposes. So we are able, that way everyone wins, so to speak, in a case like that. And adding on to that loans, too, to fill gaps. Yes, we also um, have all kinds of loans. For instance, the Talia Faro exhibit is actually on loan. The family knows if they would ever not want to store those in their homes, we would be very happy to make that our home, to display it to whenever the family would visit or for our public, but we're always looking for loans to try to work with people so that way we can display things. So Hillary and Gabby and, and Andrea have been involved. We have a calendar through 2025 with what our exhibits and programming is going to be. Some of them are a little looser in case something drops or pops up that we really want to grab onto, but we, we do try to do loans so that way, um, again, it doesn't cost us anything, but the putting up of the exhibit. Great questions. Well, I don't want to keep anyone from the brownies or any other good <laughs> stuff that Linda made, but, but feel free to stay around, look upstairs. We do just ask no food or drink on the second floor, um, but feel free to help yourselves to all of that and look around and grab our cards if you want to ask more or come back. Again, we love, we love what we do and we really appreciate everyone's support. So thank you everybody.